of know each other. I'm an AUVSI member. I'm an AMA member. I'm a supporter of the Small UAV Coalition. Jim, I don't know what to say, but I, I appreciate the hard job that you have. Can't be a member of the FA, right? So, see, yeah. um, so here's my frustration <laughs> with, I, I came here to be very supportive. So <coughs> my day job, I'm a law professor. I also write for sports. Um, the, the first bullet point on the flyer is driving me crazy because we're trying to educate the general public. And it says, what's a commercial use of UAS? Any commercial use in connection with a business, including selling photos or videos taken from the UAS. I get what you're trying to say, but the average user will not understand that. Let me give you the example that this bullet point brings out. Selling photos or videos taken from the UAS. If I go on Amazon.com right now, there are drone art photography books that Amazon is selling that our image is taken from a UAS. We do not intend to say that the seller of the image is selling contraband as if it's drugs. What we intend to say is that the person flying the aircraft for the commercial purpose is the person who is in trouble. So this is where we're running into problems on this, right? Jimmy brought up the realtor example. There are people who are flying <coughs> phantoms and whatnot to take pictures for real estate purposes, um, and then they're selling the image. The operator <coughs> is in violation of FAA rights. If they go and sell the imagery to a realtor and the realtor uses it, the realtor has a First Amendment right to use that. It's not contraband, there's no regulation which, for which we could go after the realtor. Right? I think we need to be a bit more clear about that because that's where we're running into all kinds of, of points of confusion. <coughs> um, and now I recognize that was a statement, so as a law professor, I'm going to say, so what do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so before we get started with this, again, the whole purpose of this educational campaign is we recognize before the holiday season there would be tens of thousands, if not more, of these systems out there in people's hands. We recognize that we may not get it totally right out of the box, but that's why we have a website that we can constantly update. And with input from all of you, the industry, the users, the manufacturers, we will update that more and more. As I said to you, we're just, this is the tip of the iceberg of what this technology is going to see. And as more and more users get this technology, we have to understand, and it isn't gonna be black and white. We've all had to deal with this for how many years now already. This is a very difficult situation. When you talk about safety in the national airspace and in the global airspace, this is something that we're always gonna to have to continue on with that education as the maturation of the technology. So I'll turn it over to Jim. Because we have to watch. I think you did an excellent job. First and foremost, the FAA is interested in maintaining the safety of the national airspace. And that's our, our primary role. And in doing that, we know that the, the best way to do that is to educate people. So we're trying to educate people first and foremost. I mean, that's, that's our primary role. We want people to voluntarily comply with the rules. And so the, the better we educate, the safer the system is. And, and that's what we're after with this campaign. Question here in the um, My name is Daniel Sokolov from the German Heiser Publishing Group. I'm a journalist. I have a question for uh, Mr. William. Um, I'm, I'm very happy you try to protect the airspace. I fly a lot on commercial planes in this country as a passenger. But um, I don't really understand uh, why it makes the airspace safer if someone flies over his house for fun or flies over the same house with the same equipment to take a picture to then sell his house or maybe to sell the picture to someone who sells the house. If you go look at the FAA regulations, you will see a differentiation all throughout them between private individual use of an aircraft and use of an aircraft in pursuant to the uh, It's fairly established in past history that people who are being paid to do a job are more likely to take risks in order to accomplish that than they are if they're just doing it for pleasure. So that's why the rules are different for those two different activities. Uh, it's you know it's based in, in historical fact and precedence, but it's also what the way the rules read today, and until the rules are changed, we have to enforce them as they are. I just have to comment on that. Well, I think um, you know the, the question I think is an excellent one, and I think what we believe as the Small Union Coalition is that uh, there has to be uh, you know obviously safe and responsible use. But I do think we, that your question raises a great great issue, which is. The commercial distinction, the recreational distinction. If you can fly a UAV over your vineyard and take beautiful pictures and use thermal imaging just for fun, 
then why can't you do that commercially? I think what we need to do as an industry, and this is what the Small UAV Coalition hopes to do with Mr. Williams and the FAA, um, and you know, our, our, our colleague uh, associations and all the companies, is not just criticize Jim, which I, I, I will do as well, but also to provide, thank you, I, I have, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm wittingly. Um, but what we'd like to do is, uh, it's incumbent upon us to bring answers, to, 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 to bring the technology to the FAA, to the FAA to work with us, and to ensure that we can allow for these two uh, you know, very uh, exciting endeavors, both commercial and recreational, to be safe. And so I think this campaign, while not ideal in terms of all the wording yet, um, is a good first step for new users, and is a good way for us just to demonstrate that the majority of users are going to be right in line with what the rules are. So we look forward to working with Jim on the commercial rule, and we look forward to ensuring that everyone is flying safely. If, if I may just jump in there as well, you know, we have the models, and they've been in existence for many, many years. We have an appreciation for the commercial applications of how this is going to be done, what we have to get through to understand how to utilize that to make a, a livelihood and create jobs and create wealth. There's also that piece in the middle, and that's one of the things that we're concerned about, especially this during this holiday season, is you've got anywhere from eight to eight-year-olds that now have one of these things that may or may not realize that you're not supposed to fly within five miles of an airport. I think everybody in this room thinks that's a really good idea not to do that. Living in Washington, D.C., at the end of DCA's uh, runway, there's a soccer field and a park. And, uh, and if people go there and stop flying these things, you're gonna be right in the, the landing path of, uh, of, of DCA. So these are the things that we're trying to also make sure people are aware of as we continue down the path to figure out exactly how we're gonna do this in a safe and responsible way. But many of us in this room know that it can never be 100%. There isn't any technology that we don't have that doesn't have a downside or doesn't have ill effects that come with it. What we're trying to do is make sure we minimize those and, and allow the fielding of this capability and do it in the most safe and efficient way we can. Okay, next question. Uh, you got your hand up first, then we'll go back. I'm uh, Rick Velasquez journal, hardly a, a week goes by where we don't have somebody on the strip flying a UAV, okay? Uh, obviously over a crowded area, obviously within five miles of an airport. And obviously unauthorized. And obviously unauthorized. And I think part of our mission is uh, the models are fine. They know what they're doing. They, they know what the rules are. But the new people to the game don't seem to know the rules or don't understand them. And obviously part of our role is to educate the general public as to what these rules are. If I see, as a, somebody in the general public, somebody flying over the strip, within five miles of, air, of an airport, over a crowd, what should I do as a citizen? Call the <laughs> <laughs> No, actually, that's one of the reasons you can actually tell them. You know about know before you fly. Have you, do you know that you're not supposed to be doing this right now? It, it is illegal, to, uh, unauthorized, in order to do that. And this is part of what we as a community, because we will be the ones to pay the price, regardless of who is responsible for that. So, uh, but, so I, I'll also say that, 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 that you know, Michael uh, 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 said the line, technology always wins. One of the things we have to recognize as well is that industry is aware of this. So the comment that was made that, for example, recreational users somehow are, are safer than um, you know, commercial entities. I, I, I'm not sure that I would subscribe to that view. I think the people who are uh, manufacturing, who are operating uh, on, on a commercial level are going to be far more responsible because they have much more to lose. So I'd start there. The second thing I would say is that uh, what I'm seeing within the membership of the Small UV Coalition is that one of the first things that the members are talking about is how do we make our product safer? So how do we build in technology so that it can operate within five, mi uh, five miles of an airport? or can operate in crowded areas just because the technology is built in. So technology always wins is you know, you know our tagline for the Small UAV Coalition and now the ADSI, I understand, which is great. Um, <laughs> and it wins because it provides safety. It, it promotes safety. And so this is where we want to help Jim. And, uh, and this is why I stole the mic from him, because I, I want to make sure that Jim understands that we are here to help with the technology solutions. We are here to promote safe commercial and recreational use but I, I do firmly believe that commercial use is going to be the safest uh, that we're going to see. But, but who should I call? Should I call 911 or, or what? No. Educate them. <coughs> if you were concerned about somebody's health and safety immediately, yeah, call, call the police. We've provided information to uh, 
uh, and we're in the process of distributing it as widely as we can to state, local, federal police forces to let them know what the FAA rules are and to ask them to you know, help us educate the public on what is safe and what isn't. Uh, there are uh, jurisdictions in, in the country where this is, it isn't tolerated. Uh, New York City, uh, New York City Police Force is just really cracking down. So, you know, it's just a matter of educating the, the law enforcement folks to, because they're the ones that are there. They're the ones that can answer those questions for the people and educate them. Okay, Richard. I'd just like to add to that. Um, you know, calling, everybody thinks you should call the FAA, but I might just say that maybe that's the least effective thing you can do with all due respect. I mean, they have limited resources that they can actually bring to bear on this issue. This is really a community issue. Uh, and there are many, many laws on the books within every community that deals with public nuisance, uh, trespassing, invasion of privacy, endangerment, uh, malicious mischief. I mean, law enforcement is, is well equipped to deal with aberrant behavior. I think there is an education that needs to be done because some of them are uncertain whether this is a daily week or not. But it really is a community issue, and I think that we should take it on as a community issue. I use it as an example. If you took a hammer and threw it into a crowd, you would be held responsible if that hammer comes down and hits somebody. If it misses and falls to the ground, then nothing happens. But if you hurt somebody, you're going to be held accountable. This is no different. If you fly one of these things over a crowd and yeah, it comes back safe, nothing happens. But if it does come down and hit somebody, you are going to be held responsible. And that's what we have to make sure that people understand. They are going to have to be held accountable for utilization of any technology. You can't drive a car 180 miles an hour. Some of these cars you can, but uh, you saw right here. But if you do that and you hurt somebody, you're going to be held accountable for breaking the law and operating that technology in a manner that it wasn't authorized to. So we have the white shirt here and then the white shirt in the back. Yes. Um, just, just quickly, I mean, please Rica please. Oh, Ronald Ron 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 Stein, um, and uh, about the commercial aspect, um, which, as um, Mr. Williams pointed out, is the history within the FAA that commercial people are taking more risks. Um, I beg to differ, in, actually, in this because a commercial person actually is much more liable to um, be safer that his equipment doesn't fail. Uh, on the other hand, you will have most likely insurance to ensure that something if happens that he is actually taking care of an incident. So, and all the people out there flying on the strip have no insurance if it crashes. It happens there, so it's kind of, um, the commercial aspect should be much more pushed forward in regards of. Well, the, the other aspect that I didn't mention is that there's a, uh, in 2012, Congress passed a law, uh, which is it's called an authorizing, authorizing bill for the FAA. Every so many years, they have to essentially revalidate the need for an FAA. And in that bill, they there was a section that essentially carved out a special uh, dispensation for, for modern aircraft folks. So in this case, there's there's even a crisper distinction in law between uh, commercial and uh, the model aircraft folks. So it's, it's, it's a little different than manned aircraft in that way as well. And I, I wasn't trying to offer an opinion about whether or not I thought that that was Right or wrong, I was just telling you that's the way the rules are written today. And, and until we change them for unmanned aircraft, we have to enforce the rules. Them. And obviously, laws need to be modified and changed to make sure they accommodate with society and the industries that have developed. So, wait, sure. Yeah, right. I'm sorry. Uh, and I would say that uh, and the exciting thing is we're going to have an FAA authorization discussion in the 115th Congress. So, this is a good time for us all now to be thinking about what's an ideal situation. And so, again, you come back to let's be responsible with uh, this campaign, uh, but let's also look at where we want this industry to go and how we can bring to bear uh, the incredible technologies being provided by the, the, the companies in this industry. Okay, well, that one, one question, one more question, the gentleman in the back. Yes, please yeah. say who you are. Yeah, I, my name is Mike Stevens. I'm with Channel 8 News here in town. My question is for Jim. Um, what's the hesitation to allow trusted broadcast agencies, news agencies, to utilize drones and transmit that signal outdoors. And also, do you have a timeline on when that may um, be a possibility in the future, if there, there is one? Well, the, there's no hesitation. It's just it's a matter of compliance with the, the rules we have in place. Uh, currently, we're allowing uh, commercial operations but not over people or near near crowds of people. 
so we are working with some of the major uh, news organizations trying to figure out exactly how, what procedures and what aircraft capabilities they would need to put in place in order to safely operate over the uh, So the, the process is in progress to try to sort out exactly how we can authorize news gathering using unmanned aircraft. We're just not there. We don't have the standards, we don't have procedures for what we're going. So it's, it, is a, it is a priority. Do you have a timeline, a date, maybe in the next something? Well, I, I, I know that the folks that we're working with are anxious to move forward as quickly as possible, and, and we're doing everything we can to support them. And just to add to that uh, point, there is a group here, a group of uh, journalists and news organizations that have uh, come together. We are working with them, the Small Unity Coalition. Uh, they have been before Congress uh, advocating on First Amendment uh, rights and issues. And so, so I think there is a, a prominent voice in Washington and throughout the country of journalists that are saying, that this is going to make uh, our, our role as journalists and what we can provide to consumers so much more uh, efficient and uh, kind of bring the news to life. So I think it's an exciting uh, position, especially for uh, you know, digital media in an era where it's very difficult to uh, you know, produce revenue. Uh, I will also add that last month there was a hearing, uh, House uh, Aviation Subcommittee hearing, and for me, that's been around this technology for over over 25 years. For the first time at this hearing, the tone of the hearing and the questions that were asked by the representatives was more of the line of, why can't we feel this technology? When are we going to have this soon? Well, let's, uh, what are the issues that really face us in order to make sure that we can do it in a safe and responsible way? There is a, a leadership issue that has been, uh, I think, addressed now that we are going to find ways in order to utilize this technology. And you're going to see it happen more and more, and I know you're very uh, patiently waiting for us to do it. But when we talk about safety, we really talk about two things, and I'm going to generalize more than anything else. Anything that flies in the national airspace or the global airspace can't run into anything else in the, in the national airspace or the global airspace. And two, if you fly in the national airspace or the global airspace, you can't fall out of the national airspace. It's do no harm. So those are the two concerns that we are working very feverishly on to make sure that we, one, don't cause an incident in space, and two, don't cause any damage or hurt to people on the ground. And so we will continue to put together whatever we need to do, both from an educational standpoint, which is very pertinent right now, but also to make sure that we come up with the rules, the regulations, the laws, and the ability for us to utilize this technology to take advantage of all the tremendous applications that we've all articulated and know we want to have and do it in a safe way. So I'm going to close with that right now. Uh, the residents will be here if you have any other questions to ask. And I want to thank you very much for being here this afternoon. Thank you.